good morning. How are you? Happy Sabbath to you. It's good to see everyone this morning. Well now, Sabbath school, it starts at 9.30 a.m. Hope to see you next week at 9.30 a.m. Now we will have the mission story. For nearly six years, Dr. Manuel Bellasillo served as a medical missionary at Buya Seventh-day Adventist Hospital in the African country of Cameroon. Dr. Bellasillo and his wife, Elma, were just months from completing their term of service. Those six years at Buya were only part of a 25-year mission service career for Dr. Bellasillo. Every time we ask help, he is ready to help this patient, to help this hospital. He was always a dedicated doctor. Dr. Balasillo began his medical career in Calbayog City and later in Palawan in the Philippines. Soon after being confirmed as a certified family physician, he and his family accepted a call to Africa. They served for 11 years at Yucca Adventist Hospital in a remote area some 550 miles or 990 kilometers east of Osaka, the country's capital. For a time, he was the only doctor at the hospital and therefore on call around the clock. The call to mission service was a way of life for Manuel and Elma. From Zambia, they moved to Kanye Seventh-day Adventist Hospital in Botswana. Then, for the next five years, they served at Sheer Memorial Hospital in Nepal. From Nepal, they journeyed back to Africa to serve at Baturi Adventist Hospital in Cameroon before moving to Buya Seventh-day Adventist Hospital in 2014. Regardless of where he served, Dr. Bellasilla would encourage his patients to read the Bible so they could be prepared for Jesus' soon coming. In addition, he served as a church elder and a Sabbath school teacher, as well as organizing outreach programs in various countries. In early May 2020, Dr. Bellasilla contracted malaria, and tests later showed he had also contracted COVID-19. On June 17, 2020, Dr. Manuel Bellicello fell asleep in Jesus. He was the first active international missionary for the Seventh-day Adventist Church to succumb to the pandemic sweeping the world. Like many Adventist missionaries, Dr. Bellicello was serving far from his homeland and family because he had answered Jesus' call by saying, I will go. Dr. Bellasillo leaves two daughters, both physicians at Palawan Adventist Hospital, and a son, a laboratory scientist. As we know all too well, COVID-19 has killed millions, and we have also lost many Adventist believers and church workers, our colleagues in mission to the pandemic. Like Dr. Bellasillo, these dedicated workers fell in the line of duty, carrying a message of hope to a dying world, a message of hope in his soon return. Let us remember that God leaves us on earth to encounter storms and conflicts, to perfect Christian character, to become better acquainted with God our Father and Christ our elder brother, and to do work for the Master in winning many souls to Christ, that with glad heart we may hear the words, Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter thou in to the joy of thy Lord. Until we meet again on that glorious day. I hope you enjoyed that mission story. Because now we will be...
in all. Amen. We're moving on to Wednesday lesson. Does anyone has a question? Does anyone wants to comment? The son of promise. The last scene of circumcision involved everyone, man and woman, not only Ishmael, but also all the males of Abraham household were circumcised. Genesis 17, 23 through 27. The word kol means all or every. It's repeated four times in Genesis 17, 23 through 27. As in as in Tuesday lesson, we learned that God did not exclude woman, but God circumcised the heart of all man and woman. It is against this inclusive background that God appears to Abraham to confirm the promise of a son. And his name is who? This promised son. Isaac, thank you. Through the loins of Isaac came the promised one. Anyone tell me the promised one? Who was this promised one? Jesus. Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you. What lesson of hospitality did we learn from Abraham's reception of his visitors when he saw three men walking in the heat of the day? Tell me. You learn that. Be careful. Amen. All right. Yes. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. Yes, he was. And now uh, in Genesis 18, verse 10, and he said, I will certainly return to you according to the time of life. And behold, Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. Amen. This is the time Sarah sat back and started laughing in the, in the tent because she heard what the angel said. So she started laughing. So. Let's talk about the strangers. It is not clear whether Abraham knew who these strangers were in Hebrew 13 verse 2. So remember guys, do not forget to entertain strangers. For by so doing, some have unwittingly entertained angels. Does anyone think that you have entertained angels? Brother testify. Have anyone testified angels? Have anyone entertained angels, unawares? No? Is the sound coming in clear on YouTube? Yeah. In fact, Abraham's attitude of reverence conveys a philosophy of hospitality, showing respect and care towards strangers is not just a gesture of courtesy, but this is what God wants us to do, to be kind to strangers, not to walk by someone when someone just asks for a, a piece of bread, which represents a dollar. So let us always remember, we might be entertaining an angel who asks for a piece of bread. 
Ironically, God is identified more with the hungry and needy foreigner than with the generous one who receives them. On the other hand, the divine intrusion into the human spirit denotes his grace and love toward humanity. This appearance of God anticipates Christ, who left his heavenly home and became a human servant for all mankind. So why should we be kind to those who are hungry and in need? And how does this benefit us? Yes, brother. Right, Brother Joe. Yes. Yes, Elder Flo. Amen. <laughs> right. Right. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Elder Flo. And the king will say to them in verse 40, Matthew 25, verse 40, and the king will say, Or surely I say unto you, and as much as you did it to one of the least, mm, 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 my brother, you did it to me. Mm. Yes, Elder Flo. You know what's scary is that thing that goes for good and for the things that we do to each other, go ahead. Every merciful act done to the needy, the suffering is counted as though it were done to Jesus himself. When you help the poor, sympathize with the afflicted and the oppressed, and befriend, the offering, you bring yourself closer to Jesus. So we have to always remember to emulate Jesus' character in everything that we do. And even say, because words can hurt and put a big hole in someone's heart. So we have to be careful. The words that we say from our mouth is a sword. We can bless someone or we can really hurt someone. So we moving on to Thursday. Right. Exactly. <laughs> right. Yes, he does. Yes, he does. We can't hide from him. Right. <laughs> yes, exactly. Thank you, brethren. So we're moving on to Thursday lesson. Right. Yes, thank you. Will someone read Genesis eighteen sixteen through nineteen? Yes.
Amen. Yes, 19. Amen. How does Abraham prophetic ministry affect his responsibility toward his nephew Lot? Amen. Right. Yes. And then when God looked down, the angels looked down, and they tried to search 10. Could they find 10? Not even five righteous? Wow, wow, wow. So, God's promises of a son to Abraham has just been reconfirmed. Yet, indeed, of enjoying the good news, he engages God in a passionate discussion about the fate of Lot in Sodom. Abraham not only is a prophet to whom God reveals his will, but he also is a prophet who intercedes on behalf of the wicked. The Hebrew phrase stood before the Lord is the idiom for praying. In fact, Abraham challenges God and bargains with him to save Sodom where his nephew resides, moving from 50 all the way down to 10. God would have saved the people if only 10 righteous was in Sodom. Of course, when we read the story of what happened when the two angels came to Lot to warn him of what was coming, mm, mm, mm. in Genesis 7, in Genesis 19, 1 through 10. We can see just how sick and evil the people had become in Sodom. It was truly was a wicked place, as were many other nations around them. One reason why eventually they were driven from the land of Canaan. Genesis 15, verse 16. Can someone read Genesis 15, verse 16? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Elder Flo. Would anyone like to comment on the people who live in Sodom? Did they want to listen? Did they try to listen? Right. Right. Yes. And Elder Flo, thank you. Yes, they did. They refused to listen. Right. Mm. Mm. Thank you. They did not believe. Mm. Yes. They did not want, they wanted the three men. Right. 
Right. Yes, brother. Yes, yes. <laughs> no, it didn't. Amen. Now, the last night of Sodom was approaching. Did someone want to comment? Yes, I don't. Yes, Brother Perry. Yes. Yes. Thank you, Brother Barry. Amen. We should. Amen. We have to. Yes. Thank you, Elder Flo. Thank you. We have to. In Genesis 15, verse 16. But in the fourth generation, they shall return here. For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. In Genesis 15, verse 16. But in the fourth generation, they shall return here, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. In Genesis 15, verse 16. The last day was like the the last day was like every other. They had come and gone. Evening fell upon a scene of loveliness and security. The last day was like the, the last day was like every other. They had come and gone. Evening fell upon a scene of loveliness and security. The last day was like the last day was like every other. They had come and gone. Is this in the zoom? Yes. Go back to the zoom. Thank you. 
Thank you, my sister. The last day was like every other that had gone, that had come and gone. Evening fell upon a scene of loveliness and security. A landscape of unrivaled beauty was bathed in the rays of the declining sun. The coolness of Emmetide had called forth the inhabitants of the city, and the pleasure-seeking crowds were passing to and fro, intent upon the enjoyment of the hour. Even so, the time will, will be the same as it was in Sodom and Gomorrah. And in the time of Noah, they went about doing their daily activities and to destruction strike. In the end, God saved only Lot, his wife, and his two daughters. Almost half the minimum of 10 people survived. That beautiful country was then destroyed. The Hebrew word hafak, which means overthrew, occurs several times in the passage. One inspired writer wrote, two of the heavenly messengers departed, leaving Abraham alone with him whom he now knew to be the son of God. And the man of faith pleaded for the inhabitants of Sodom. Once he had saved them by his sword, now he endured to save them by prayer. Lot and his household were still dwellers there. And the unselfish love that prompted Abraham to their rescue from the Elamites now sought to save them if it were God's will from the storm of the divine judgment. God blot out its wicked inhabitants in, the, in Noah's time. In mercy, he destroyed the cover. Through the deceptive power of Satan, the workers of iniquity obtain sympathy and admiration and are those constantly leading others to rebellion. It was so in Cain's and in Noah's time, and it is right now in our time, the end of time that we're living in today. It is, it's, it is God's mercy that he's shown to all of us in this entire globe his grace and mercy that he have. This is why family, God tell us in the New Testament, watch and pray, watch and pray. Do we have any comment in this end of time? Is it similar to Sodom and Gomorrah? Is it similar? Yes, it is. Yes. Yes. We're moving on to Friday lesson. The way. And few there be that find. And he's talking to his people. You know what I'm saying? He's talking to people who read the Bible. So what is that saying about us? Mm. <laughs> we must be in constant prayer, continuously, nonstop. And even if everything is fine in your household, continue praying. We must not stop praying because we're fine. We must continue praying in happiness and in sadness. Amen? Father thought, in Genesis 18, 22 through 33, Abraham 
patient and tenacious plea with God on behalf of the people of Sodom to encourage us to pray for the wicked, even though they appear to be in a hopeless condition of sin. Furthermore, God's attentive response to Abraham's insistence and his willingness to forgive for the sake of only ten righteous men. All around us are souls going down to ruin, as helpless as terrible as that which befall Sodom. Every day the probation of some is closing. Every hour some are passing beyond to reach, the, mm, to reach mercy. And where are the words, where are the voice warning to come and accept Jesus Christ as the personal savior? Where are the hands stretched out to draw him back from death? Where are those who with humility and perseverance of faith are pleading with God? Mm. The spirit of Abraham was the spirit of Christ. The son of God is himself the great intercessor for all mankind. He who has paid the price for its redemption knows the worth of the human soul. Ellen G. White. The rainbow and circumcision are called signs of the covenant. Is that true? True? What are the common points and the difference between the two covenants? Amen. The rainbow represents that God will not destroy the world with a flood. True? The rainbow can be seen, true? And the other covenant is the what? Circumcision of what? Amen. Which cannot be seen. Which is your faith. Amen. We must have faith. We have to change our negative attitude in order for God to circumcise our heart. In everything that we do, God is working, circumcising our heart and making us more like the character of Jesus Christ so that when he come again, we're ready. Amen? We jumping on that boat. Well, I don't want to say boat <laughs> because we're not going to be on the boat. We're going to be lifted up from the ground. Mm. Amen? Does anyone have to say something? Anyone want to comment? Yes. Amen. Amen. And as long as we just continue praying and emulating the character of Jesus Christ, we'll be ready for Jesus when he come again. We'll be ready for God. And submitting. Even if we don't want to, but we have to. And God will continue preparing us for the kingdom of heaven. And those who refuse to accept Jesus Christ into their heart, they will one day see when God will look and say, I do not know you. And that will be the hardest word that anyone can take when God look and say, I do not know you. Depart from me. I've been pleading. I sent all the, I sent all the flow. I sent all these saints. And you refuse. And right now, God is closing the time. We're living in the end of time. And we all have to get ready. We're in this terrible pandemic. And finally, we are here to congregate as sisters and brothers. We have to sincerely love each other, 
even if we don't like the way how the person dress or wear his hair, we must know that all that is material things ain't going to burn one day. Because God is, God is preparing us. And I know I'm ready. Are you guys ready? Ready? Raise your hand. Raise your hands. Please. I want to see the I want to see everyone's hands raised. Amen. We're ready. So Jesus Christ, we come to you saying thank you, Lord, for blessing us. Thank you that we are here at Ebenezer, 1437 Christian Street, to fellowship with you. We thank you for giving us this beautiful Sabbath day because you've given us this day to remember you are our creator. Without you, we are nothing. With you, we are everything. Lord, we're asking you to continue circumcising our heart, each individual here or in Zoom, throughout the whole entire globe, preparing us for this beautiful coming when you come down once again. Woo! With the archangel, Lord. Mm. We want to be ready, God. Prepare us, Lord, for this beautiful day when you come. That, Lord, we don't want to hear, depart from me, I do not know you. So we just want to say thank you, Lord, for opening this door so that we all can come in in peace. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. I want to thank you, Zenaida Martin, for doing our Sabbath school lesson. I want to thank you, all of you for participating. And we just thank you, thank God, for loving and caring for us, bringing us together this day. And she's given us a, a, a closing prayer for Sabbath school. And before we transition into our, our worship service, I want to just say thank you all for coming and watching and participating. And we just thank God for everybody. Let's close our, this out this portion with prayer. Our loving Father, we're so thankful for your love, your mercy, but most of all, we're thankful for Jesus. Thank you for being here this Sabbath day, this Women's Day. And we pray now, Father, that you'll continue to be with us. Bless our worship services with the blessing you have in store for us. And Lord, may our worship be acceptable to thee. In Jesus' name, amen.
There is a registration requirement to participate in the pastoral farewell. So you'll get that information and uh, you'll just follow the form when you click on the link. Uh, you, it will be sent to your email as, that's on record and uh, it will be advertised each week and during the week so that you can uh, prepare. Okay? All right?
We are women of faith. All right. All 110, all in. Everyone is requested to support this ministry by giving a minimum of $110 per person. We would appreciate 110, all in. 210, all in. 310, all in. All. We want you to, the sky is the limit, but we appreciate you participating as we are all in with the 110. Have you ever wondered why you're a church member? Now, some people belong to the church because they love their pastor's sermons. Other love the social interactions, the music, and the potlucks. And still others belong to the church because they believe that this is the right thing to do. Now, there's nothing wrong with any of those reasons, but shouldn't we have less self-centered reasons for being together as the worldwide body of Christ? Jesus' reason for coming to this world was not self-centered. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Now, Jesus also said that God sent him to save the world through him. And following in Jesus' footsteps, the church and its members should never lose sight of one of the main reasons why they are together, to save the world. And this means embracing a universal mission. It requires us to pray, plan, and act together as a world body to save people not only locally, but also regionally and globally. By planning and working together as the global body of Christ, we become stronger and we can go farther and faster. But where do the resources that we need to accomplish our worldwide mission come from? Now, among other things, the plan of tithe and offerings and the way those funds are distributed worldwide in an equitable way provides us with an opportunity to join Jesus in his global mission unselfishly. Now, the story is told of a pastor who refrained from educating his members about the danger of self-serving generosity and the importance of supporting the missionary endeavors of the global church family. His large and well-off congregation was known for its generosity. But instead of focusing on Jesus' worldwide commission, they were keen to invest in the regular upgrading of their church facilities. Unfortunately, sometimes this meant that they would stop returning a faithful tithe and participating in regular missionary offerings to invest almost exclusively in their local church. After some years, the conference transferred this pastor to a different and less affluent locality, and he quickly understood the consequences of the narrow vision of mission he once had. How large is our vision of God's mission? We are saved because God emptied heaven and sent Jesus to our world. Following Jesus' footsteps, the church at some point mobilized resources to send a missionary to your home country or region. With Jesus as our model, would you also like to be an instrument of love to every nation, tribe, language, and people? Each time we worship God with our tithe and promise, we have another opportunity to give globally, joining Jesus in saving the world. May we put our desires last and God first. All right, we have three ways to give here at Ebenezer. In person, you can come to the church and bring it with you. The offering plates are offering at the end. And you can also drop it in the mailbox. You can also call an elder or a deacon to come get it and bring it to it for you. We also have a, a mail-in at our post office box, 3866 Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, 19146. And then we have online giving at Cash App, uh, dollar sign ESDAC Philly, and also at AdventistGiving.com. So let's bow our head and let's thank God for the offering that you are continuing to serve us. Father in heaven, we're so thankful, God, that you just bless us so richly in spite of ourselves. So we are happy to return that which is yours and to give a generous offering. So thank you, Lord, for your blessings. In Jesus' name, amen.
seeking for a city hallelujah i am seeking
God, we just want to come to you and just praise you and thank you. We ask forgiveness of all of our sins. We lay our burdens at the foot of the cross. We invite you continuously to worship with us here at Ebenezer. Thank you for the Women's Ministry Day. Thank you for your participants. And then, Father, I'm lifting up the woman of God that you have sent at Ebenezer for this day. Lord, I lift up our speaker today, Elkin Rogers. Lord, you used her before. We want today a fresh hunger of the Holy Spirit. God, Paul, fill her with your spirit. Lord, open our hearts and minds that you may receive what you prepared her for and what you shall tell her the Father that she's my Lord. The Father, open up our hearts that we may receive your word from our Savior. We lift up all of Ebenezer family and all of our listeners in victory, Lord, and as a keep us, Lord. Lead us, wake us up, help us to see ourselves as you do. Help us to know that you are loving and kind and you're not willing to be to perish, but all should come to you. So, Father, as we are abiding our time, while we're waiting for your soon return, make us ready to meet you in peace. Forgive us of all of our sins and shortcomings. Rid us of our iniquity. Search us, O God, and us. See if there's any good way of us. Then, Father, put our feet on the right path and lead us in the way to turn. We thank you, we praise you, we love you. In Jesus' name, amen.
Good morning, all souls in Christ. And happy Sabbath. I will be reading from Proverbs 3, 5 through 6 from the English Standard Version. I'll wait a little minute for you to turn pages to come to the verse that I will be reading. And it's on the screen. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart, not just any part, but all your heart. And do not lean on your own understanding. And do in all your ways acknowledge him. Acknowledge him. And he will make straight your paths. May the words that I just read bring joy to each listener with peace in your heart, within your heart, and never forget that Jesus loves you very much. Have a blessed day. Our speaker is Denny Annette Rogers, and she resides in, in South New Jersey. She and her husband Rob have two adult children and three grandchildren. She is a prolific writer and poet who has been writing poetry since age nine. Denny is often called upon to write poetry for many organizations and special events, such as birthday parties, graduations, holidays, retirement parties, and weddings, just to name a few. She has an entire greedy card line entitled Penny's Pieces, which she hopes to launch this year. Penny is the most sought after poet at her church, her workplace, and in her community and has recited poetry in various states, including Delaware, Maryland, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and California. She has a zest and zeal for writing, and is sometimes called upon to write poetry on demand. Penny's excellent spelling and proofreading skills have afforded her the opportunity to proof and edit papers for several doctoral candidates. Penny serves as an elder, Sabbath school teacher, and prayer warrior leader at Mount Olivet SDA Church in Camden, New Jersey. Penny has a Bachelor of Science degree in Business Administration and is in the process of completing her master's degree as a licensed professional counselor. Penny currently works for the Allegheny East Conference Corporation as an assistant to the Directors of Communication Technology and Women's Ministries. She enjoys reading, but her favorite pastimes are writing, shopping, and spending quality time with family and friends. She has many favorite Bible verses, but the most current one is found in Isaiah 65, 24. And it shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer. And while they are yet speaking, I will hear. I am so proud and very honored to introduce my sister and my friend, Elder Penny Bennett Rogers, a woman of God, with a message from God to the people of God. He will be heard after our special meeting. Special music is coming from this is my music. 
a joy, a privilege, and an honor to be here this morning because this place is home to me. You know, I saw in the youth choir here with Jackie, Elder Florine, Lisa, and so I go all the way back in Ebenezer. You know, my dad's been a member of this church for I don't know how many years. I want to thank Pastor McConnell for allowing me to stand here today in his place. And Sister McConnell for the invitation to call and minister you today on this Women's Day. So I thank them very, very much. I look out and I see some friends of my dad, Michelle, his usher buddies, Miss Dancine and all that, Mr. Jimmy. And it makes me feel good when I come to Ebenezer. It really does. Because my dad loved this church. For those of you who don't know my dad, who may be visiting with us, uh, George O'Brien Sr., who was the elder here before he passed in 2017. So this church has always had a special place in my heart. I want to also let everyone know that Elder McConnell, Pastor McConnell, Sister McConnell was really, really there for our family during that time. They will always have a special place in my heart. Every time I was there, Elder McConnell was there. And he was suffering a lot of losses in his own family, but he still took time out to be there for my family, and that means the world to me. I mean, I was telling everybody in the conference about Pastor McConnell. I was, because that really, really meant a lot to me. Well, our topic is a woman after God's own heart, but I see men in the audience. <laughs> and we know that God said David was a man after his own heart, right? So this morning, I'll be talking to the men and the women. So I would want the men to feel slighted in any way, because this message is for you as well. Let me just bear out for a short word of prayer, and then we'll delve right into the word. Father God. I'm just an empty vessel waiting to be filled by you. I can do nothing without you, but I know that with you all things are possible. Hide me behind the cross so that your glory will be revealed. Humble me so I can do your glory. It's not about me, it's about lifting up the name of Jesus. And so, Father God, use me this day. It's my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. The key theme of my message today is that wash your heart is right with God. Then he can order your steps. Amen. Then you can live within his will as you follow the Holy Spirit leading and guiding you. So what does it mean to be a man or a woman after God's own heart? When God looks for leaders, he is not on search for someone who's perfect. Is he? You know why? Because none of us are. The word of God says in Romans 3.23 that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. In Romans 3.10 it says, I do the None is righteous. None not one. So God is searching for men and women like you and me. But he is also looking for people who share the same qualities he found in David. And that was a woman or man after God's own heart. What does it mean to be a person after God's own heart? Well, listen, it means your life is in harmony with the Lord. What is important to Him is important to you. What burdens Him burdens you. When He says go to the right, you go to the right. When He says go to the left, you go to the left. When He says stop with your door, you stop. And when he says this is wrong and I want you to change, you don't try to justify the actions. You come to terms with it because you have a heart for God. We are all familiar with the game. Remember Simon says? Simon says this. Simon says that. You repeat what the person says, but then if you mess up, you're out the game. Well, it's Christian. We should be living our lives with what God says. God says, love everybody. God says, forgive. God says, trust me. God says, not your will, but my will be done. When you are a man or a woman after God's heart, it's an 
God, it reads, for the eyes of the Lord move to and fro throughout the earth on Moses part, that he may strongly support those whose heart is completely his. Listen to that. It says the Bible verse says strongly support. Strongly support those whose heart is completely his. It makes me want my heart to be completely his, but I know that he's going to strongly support me. What is God looking for? He is looking for men and women whose hearts are his completely. That means there's no skeleton to the top. No hidden agendas. Not that they are swept on the rug. That means when you do wrong, you admit it, you repent, you turn away from that sin because you long to please God in your actions. God is looking for deeply spiritual, genuinely humble, honest to the core servants who have integrity. Yeah. Now you see, integrity is who you are when nobody is watching you. Well, it's one thing when we're at church and we all look pretty and the men look handsome and we're all sitting here and we're doing the right thing, we're in the house of the Lord. But what are you like at home? What are you like in your workplace? What are you like when people run into you in the stores and the marketplaces? What are you like when you drive on the highway and somebody cuts you off? Okay, when nobody is looking, when nobody is looking, you still have to represent Christ. You, uh, you know why? Because God is watching, and you can't fake it with God. He knows all, and he sees all. And he's not impressed by outward appearances. He's not impressed by power or prestige, by degrees or how much money you make. You see, man looks on an outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. He always focuses on the inward quality, like the character of the heart. Those things that take time and discipline to cultivate. Well, I believe that a man or woman after God's own heart is one who abides in God, is committed to prayer and Bible study, but means trust and obey the word of God. Does not let anything or anyone stand between their soul and the Savior. Repent and turn away from sin. Represents Christ in all things and in all ways, walks in the path of righteousness, and is willing to be used by God. Now, Jeremiah 17 9, some scripture text when you read it, it really reminds you just how simple you are, and this is one of them. The heart is deceitful above all things. Above all things. I'm like, wow, when I read that scripture text that said that our righteousness was like filthy bad. Do not forget my teaching, 
but let your heart keep my commandments. For the length of days and years of life and peace they will add to you. Let my steadfast love and faithfulness forsake you. Find them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. So you will find favor and good success in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. This is the verse 7. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. It will be healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. Now let's break this verse of scriptures down. Do not forget my law. Solomon's advice as a father to his son in this section begins with a warning to never forget God's word. Oh, thanks to God, I'm here to tell you that we have to start reading and studying God's word to the point where it's right here in our mind. It's good to put Bible verses to memory. It really is. It is also connected to a life of obedience. If we mentally remember God's word, but we fail to obey, then we could say that we have forgotten God's commands. Our goal in obedience is not just outward conformity to God's will, but a heart that loves and obeys God. James 1.22 says, But be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Because you deceive if you think you can do one without the other. A lot of times when we are here, we read a scripture and we say, and let the word and let the Lord add a blessing to the reading, hearing, and application of the Holy Word. That's because you gotta do more than reading. <laughs> or you gotta do more than hear a sermon. You have to live. Now the heart is the first thing that wanders away from God. Isn't that interesting? But it's also the first thing that returns to God. It's the first thing that returns to God. And it says, let my mercy and truth forsake you. Solomon wisely told his son to keep God's royal love and truth close in his heart. Now, you know where necklace and hands usually starts right this is right where the heart is. He said, keep God's word right there, close to your heart. Solomon told his son, when he talked about trust in the Lord, to live a life of trust in God. It is our nature to put our trust in something or someone, even in sometimes ourselves. Now listen to this. Lean not on your own understanding. Trust in God with all our heart means to decide to put away our own understanding and instead choose to trust God and his understanding. You know why? Isaiah 55, 9 says, For as the heavens are higher than earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. And when it says lean not, we can trust God because we can lean on him when things get bad. We trust him because he can hold us up when we begin to fall. It's good to have, how many of you have close friends like that? That you can lean on in a crutch. They're there for you no matter what. I mean, if you even have one of these friends, you're blessed. Yeah. If you have more than one, you are doubly blessed. How many of you are familiar with the trust fall? Okay, I did it in a team building exercise. I was working at the Y.A. or pharmaceutical company and put a day and said, we're not going to work. We're going to go outside and we're going to do team building exercise. So what they wanted you to do Stand there, somebody behind it, and you just fall back. But I love it. I don't know who behind you. I don't know who will catch you. It's called a trust fall. And I'm going to tell you, I was not going to trust you, y'all. I was not. I mean, I'm falling back. Who's back there? She's like, don't ask. Just fall back. We're trying to promote trust between teams. Now I felt bad. And thank God they caught me. Thank God I'm a lot smaller than I am now. <laughs> no, I'm serious. <laughs> because, I, but you know what? We can rely on God to catch us every single time. Doesn't matter how small, how big we are, God can, he can catch us. The trust fall. In all the ways that God him, and not him in all that you do, you know, seek him for counsel, pray to him for strength, ask him for guidance. You know, every time when 
things were wrong. Solomon's very, very seldom really God first. We do. We try to figure it out ourselves first. We'll call a friend on the phone first. We may call a parent or somebody first. We may go to a co-worker first. But God wants us to come to him first. Even for a small matter, like you try to make a decision what home to live in. What job to take? What you should purchase? God is interested even in all those small little details of our lives. He wants us to He wants us to consult him first. Okay. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Can I turn this on? Do not be wise in your own eyes. We cannot lean on our own understanding because our understanding is not always clear or right. We can be trusted in our Savior. As much as we think we can know, our wisdom is never better or greater than God's. I don't care how many degrees you have, I don't care how smart you think you are, you are never smarter than God. This morning, I want to share with you eight ways you can be a woman or man after God's own heart. The first one is you have to abide in God. John 15, 5 says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit, but apart from me, you can do nothing. Now, we get our nourishment and strength from the vine, right? Isn't that what the branches, they get the nourishment and strength from the vine when, it, when it's connected? So we need to be connected. John 15, 7 says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, oh, I love this. Listen to this. Ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Listen to that. All you got to do is abide in God and whatever you wish, it will be done for you. It sounds simple, doesn't it? Jesus describes here the essence of a fruitful Christian life. By faith, we must stay connected to Christ every second of every day to live the most God honoring and abundant life of peace and fruitfulness in Christ. After explaining to his disciples how his father is the gardener that prunes each branch so that he can bear much fruit, Jesus urged them to stay grafted in it. The image is powerful, but how does one stay connected this way? God intends for us to be mindful of him and to pray without ceasing. He instructs us to be filled continually with his spirit so that we can walk by his spirit. The fruit that Jesus means for his disciples to bear is that of the Holy Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And also that of effective ministry. Both are impossible apart from Christ and the life-giving presence of his Holy Spirit in us. For the Christian, it is not necessary to learn one by one each part of the truth of the Spirit. Merely abiding in Christ will cause us to love the Lord with all our heart, soul, and strength and love our neighbor as ourselves. In this way, we will exhibit all the truth there is God is my God, and having put to death the works of the flesh. Number two, be committed to prayer and Bible study. Now we're all familiar with the scripture to take the effectual fervor of prayer to write to the bell of March. How many of you believe that? Prayer is powerful. The word of God also says, Thy word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin this day. When God, when you get ready to do something wrong and you have the word hidden in your heart, a scripture test will come to mind and be like, you better not do that. Stop. It will remind you that what you're about to do is not right. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Commitment to prayer and Bible study helps us stay on the straight and narrow path that leads to righteousness. The Bible is the blueprint for righteousness. The word acts as a mirror of confidence to show us the right way to go. We are living in the last days of Earth's history. One day we will not have a Bible. So it is important to know the word of God, to remember the promises in God's word. 
that will give you strength and hope as you claim the promises of God's word and prayer. It will remind you that we serve a God who hears and answers prayers, and that the God we serve is the God of His word. We can trust Him with our heart and with everything. Second Timothy two fifteen says, "Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth." Also, we need to study so we can give an account for our faith. 1 Peter 3 15 states, But in your heart, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. If you're trying to be a true witness for the Lord, you need to know and understand the Word of God and not be afraid to share the good news of the gospel. Knowing the word of God and walking in the spirit will give you a Holy Ghost boldness that you never had before. Number three, believe and claim God's promises. Is anything too hard for God? I say it's not. Sarah was a woman after God's heart. In many ways, she represents women of faith who step out on God's word. Even when they don't understand how things will work out. Sarah accompanied her husband Abraham on a journey to the country of God's choosing. Many married women have, of God have faithfully followed their husband as he was following God. Notice I said that. As he was following God. <laughs> However, Sarah, like most women, became impatient after many years passed, and she still did not have their father's child. So guess what she did? We all know the story. Instead of waiting on God, she did what we sometimes try to do. We try to help God out. As if he needs our help. Sarah figured, okay, if I can't give my husband a child, I know what I can do. I'll give him my servant girl. As a surrogate wife. And then she can bear a child for us. Now women, we know that's danger, right? Women, we know how jealous we get. Come on now. You can't give him a child, but this woman can? I don't even know why she suggested it in the first place. Being a woman myself, you know what I'm saying? But that was her suggestion. She said, okay, so now Hagar, you know, and what happened, you know, she started treating Hagar. Hagar bore a son to Abraham. Both Abraham and Sarah, now, I don't know, that would have been my solution. I, I don't know what they had back then. They probably didn't have, you know, too many solutions like we have today, but that would not have been my solution. Both Abraham and Sarah forgot God's ability to fulfill his promise. We have to remember that when we pray, the answer is either yes, no, or wait. But we have problems with the wait. In this case, God made the promise, so they knew he was, if God tells you he's going to do something, how are going to not believe God? If God say you want to bear a son, <laughs> how you going to not believe that if it came right from him? But here we have at age 90, Sarah became pregnant by Abraham when he was 100 years old. Now, you guys are going to laugh because I was actually thinking about having a baby at age 50. And my church members, they're like, yo, and we will be teasing you and you guys will be called Abraham and Sarah from now on. Listen. <laughs> That would be the new name. Of course, I woke up and came to my senses. But I actually was thinking about it. But the key thing is that we can trust God as we journey along the path of life. Even when we don't understand how or why he does things. Even when we can't trace it, we still need to trust him. Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. Talking about being a woman, Man, after God's own heart. Number four, don't put anyone or anything in place of God. Now, this might touch on some things. Sometimes we place so much attention on people or things that we make them an idol. Our idol is when something or someone becomes more important to us than God. By that definition, even good things can become idols when we make them the ultimate thing in our lives. Anything or anyone can become an idol if we place the value for that thing or person above our value for God. 
If we are fixated on people and things too much, we can't hear God or see God clearly because our hearing is muffled and our vision is obscure. The word of God says in Exodus 20, starting in verse 3, and we all know it. What do it say? You shall have what? There you go. I know you guys know it. You shall have no other gods before me. And most of the time, we look at that, we're thinking only idols. We don't realize that things and people can become idols. Our spouses, boyfriends, children, jobs, possessions, money, cars, you name it, can be idols in our lives. Even music, television, our phones, the internet. Anytime we spend so much time, you got some people that won't put their phone down. You don't get to sleep with their phone in their bed. You know, seriously, say for God, some people's phone is right beside them in the bed. They can't go anywhere. I remember back in the day when we didn't even have phones. We still manage. I remember when a beeper first came out. I think I was in my 20s when a pager came out. They would call you and then you would get to a phone and call a person back. But we didn't have the internet. We didn't have any of that stuff. And we managed. But now, I remember my, my daughter, she had some friends over. They all came over because they missed each other, right? I walk in the kitchen and everybody's on their phone. So I, I stopped. I said, give me your phones. And they looked at me like I asked them for, I don't know, for blood. I said, give me your phones. And they go, why, why? I said, just give me your phones, please. Did, did you guys say miss each other and you wanted to spend time together? I said, well, hand me your phone. Just give it to me for one hour. Well, you know that after the hour was up, they was having so much fun socializing and spending time together, they didn't even ask me back for their phones. We put too much stock into this stuff. We do. We spend too much time with these things. And we might even not realize we make an idol out of all that because it happens so subtle. Matthew 19, 29 says, and everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or lands for my name's sake will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. God is a jealous God and he does not want anyone or anything to take his place in our lives. Number five, we can't and turn away from sin. This is where I'm going to share a personal testimony with you. I, just like some of you, had a shady past, but God turned my life around. My co-worker, Margie, and thank you, Margie, so much. I love her singing. That melodious voice, thank you so much. Margie made the courage of just sharing at the job. I want to share with you how God saved me. Me, how he delivered me, how he transformed me, and how he set me free. I'm telling you, if it had not been for the Lord on my side, I don't know where I would be today. I remember it like it was yesterday. It was 35 years ago, though. It was on a Sabbath, February 21st, 1987, when I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And my life has been different ever since. I'm going to share my story with you in a form of poetry that depicted my life then and my life now. It's about God, his saving power, his sustaining power, his healing power, his Holy Ghost power. And sometimes we just need to be reminded of his goodness, grace, and mercy toward us. I always love the story of a lost sheep because it reminds me of myself. And Luke 15, one through seven, this is the New Living Translation. Tax collectors and other notorious sinners often came to listen to Jesus teach. This made the Pharisees and teachers of religious law, religious law, complain that he was associated with such simple people, even eating with them. So Jesus told them this story: If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them gets lost, what will he do? Won't he leave the 99 others in the wilderness and go to search for the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, what is he going to do? He will be joyful, right? He will joyfully carry it home on his shoulder. And when he arrives, he will call together all his friends. Oh, come here. Rejoice with me because they're lost sheep. I found it. In the same way, there is more joy in heaven over one lost sinner who repents and returns to God 
and over 99 are who are righteous and have it straight away. I was lost going nowhere fast, headed down that wide path that leads to destruction instead of going down that narrow path that leads to eternal life. But God found me, rescued me, and saved me from myself. And here's my story. It's called A Change of Hearts. I'm here to tell you a story about the way things used to be when I had my own agenda, footloose and fancy free. You see, life to me back then was all fun and games. The crowd I hung out with was one and the same. I thought that money was the key to success and that with lots of it, you would truly be blessed. It was all about self back in those days. I wasn't proud of myself or my wicked ways. I totally forgot where I was supposed to be about the Savior who lived and then died for me. I always felt like something was missing from my life. Though I thought I was having fun, my hand has caused me strife. Life back then just didn't make sense. I was always worried, anxious, and tense. I just couldn't remember previous sermons I've heard, my parents' words of wisdom, promises in God's word. I thought that life was supposed to be a ball. It's your thing, it's your life, you make the call. You see, I lost sight of what Christ wanted for me, to be prosperous, healthy, with heaven as my destiny. I didn't know then what I know now, that if you're on the wrong course, then sin will always abound. It took some hard times for me to really understand that my life was not in harmony with God's great plan. But thank God the Holy Spirit ministered to me, saw my distress, and came and rescued me. I fell on my knees with tears in my eyes, asked God to forgive me as I started to apologize. I told him how sorry I was for all that I've done. He said, my child, you're forgiven. The battle was already won. I said, from this day forward, I will try to do what's right. That dark cloud that hung over me was replaced with sunlight. Now my life gets better and better each day as I draw closer to him as I fast and pray. For I know that when difficulties unfold, the promises in God's word are like silver and gold. They will bring you comfort no matter what you're going through. And there's always a person that ministers right to you. Now I know where true happiness lies. It's not in my own agenda, but in loving others more than I. So I'll end this story, and I hope you agree that Christ is all you'll ever need to be completely happy. <laughs> so my brothers and sisters, I'm in a good place in my life right now. My life is so much sweeter than it was. My future is so much brighter. Although I thought I was having fun out there, I was never truly happy. I always felt like there was something missing from my life. And that, my friends, was Jesus Christ. The one who died on the cross at Calvary for you and me. I may not be rich or have a lot of fortune or fame, but I had the assurance of salvation. And you can't get any richer than that. Thank you, Lord, for setting me free. My new destiny is happy. Thank you for allowing me to share my testimony through poetry. Now I'm trying to wrap this thing up, y'all, but I don't want to be too long. I'm on the sixth point. <laughs> be like Christ in all things and in all ways. Imitate God, therefore, in everything you do because you are his dear children. Live a life filled with love, follow an example of Christ. He loved us and offered himself as a sacrifice for us, a pleasing aroma to God. I remember a story my oldest brother Wendell shared with me a long time ago. It was about a wife who remained dutiful to her husband despite his treatment of her. He would often stay out late drinking and carousing with his co-workers and friends. Yet no matter what time he came home, she would have his clothes ironed for the next day and his dinner on the table. She didn't ask, where are you? Or why do you keep doing this to me? She just kept being who she was, a child of God, seasoned with flavor. After months and months, I don't even, may, may have been years, the story may be a little distorted since my brother shared it. But the man did this repeatedly, I'll put it that way. And the wife just kept crying. One day, the husband came into the living room and wanted to know, why are you being so nice to me? 
I treat you bad. I come home and I feel like it. I don't consider your feelings, and yet and still, you always have my dinner ready and my clothes ironed for work the next day. He went on to say, I feel bad that I've been treating you this way. The wife responded, I'm just doing what Christ would have me to do. When my brother first shared the story with me, I said, she's a better woman than I am. <laughs> but I was really down in my face at the time. <laughs> Let me just clear that up. I was really in my wall, and I'm like, what? No, he wouldn't have no dinner on the table. And definitely wouldn't have any clothes on. He would have to use the cleaners. Anyway, to make a long story short, <laughs> The man decided that he wanted to pursue a career in the ministry as a result of his wife being so gentle and kind with him and now they both are ministers of the gospel. Hallelujah! The moral of the story, when you remain Christ-like no matter how others treat you, it shows them who Jesus Christ really is more than anything else because you're not just talking about it, you're living it. And we all would rather see a sermon any day than to hear one. It's called practice what you preach. I say all this for a reason because sometimes in this Christian life, let's be honest, we feel like we don't deserve the treatment we get. And when people treat us bad, we want to see God give them their vengeance. If he want, we want to see God repay them right now. We do. We want them to get what's coming to them. A lot of people today struggle with the fact why evil people are allowed to keep prospering on. When I gave my cousin Bible studies, that's the one thing they couldn't get past. They were like, why? Why is evil still going on all this time? But the word of God says, vengeance is mine, I will repay. And when God pays them back, sometimes it's worse than what you could imagine. You know, and we're not supposed to blow. When people who've done things to us are starting to do bad, that's not Christ's life. We still pray for them. The Bible tells us to love our enemies and pray for them to despitefully use us and persecute us. I found out in life that the message learned is not always for the other person. Sometimes it's for you. If you've been treated badly, my mom would say, you kill more flies with honey. So if you've been talked about, don't stoop down to someone else's level. In other words, be like Christ in all things and in all ways, and you will receive a rich reward. Listen to this. 1 Peter 3, 1 and 2 says, Wives, in the same way, submit yourself to your own husband, so that if any of them do not believe the word, they may be won over with words by the behavior of their wives, when they see the purity and reverence of your lives. Number seven, I'm wrapping it up soon. Walk in the way of the Lord. Oh, uh, we all know Psalms 1 1. You guys can even repeat this with me. Psalms 1 1 and 2. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel, I'm reading from the English Standard Version, of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. This is scholar. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. Psalm 119 says, Blessed, 1 through 5, blessed are the underfall of the way who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are they that keep his testimonies and that seek him with the whole heart. They also do no iniquity, they walk in his ways. Verse 4, God has commanded us to keep thy precepts diligently. Verse 5, O that my ways were directed to keep thy statutes. With my whole heart have I sought thee. Let me not wander from your commandments. Your word I have hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. Make me to understand the way of your precepts, so I shall talk of thy wondrous works. Make me go in the path of your commandments, for therein do I delight, and I walk in liberty, for I seek thy precepts. I'm on my last verse, and then we'll wrap on. Verse number, number eight is the last point about being a woman in God. A woman and man after God's own heart. Be willing to be used by God. Philippians 2.13 says, For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Rahab was a prostitute whose house was part of Jericho's defensive wall. When Joshua sent spies into Jericho, the spies lodged in Rahab's house. When the soldiers came looking for the spies, Rahab came down on a rooftop 
until the king's soldiers and the spies were not there. Because of her great courage and kindness, the spies promised Rahab that her family would not be harmed during the destruction of Jericho. Rahab was told to hang a scarlet cord out the window so the Israelites would know that her family should be spared. Rahab's story has told women throughout time that God uses whoever he chooses to fulfill his mission. God doesn't always choose the most righteous individual. He chooses those who are most willing. When God comes into our hearts, we can truly become new people. Men and women after God's own heart. Also, let's not criticize or talk about those who have a shady past. We cannot discredit anyone who may turn their life around and accept Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. In closing, I have to say this, because this is something that I do all the time. In closing, a woman after God's own heart knows how to praise the Lord. She sings praises to God because she recognizes the goodness of the Lord. I'm convinced that one of the main reasons God called David a man after his own heart was that David was a man of praise. The Bible tells us that David had a vow of praise unto the Lord. Seven times a day he would praise the Lord. And three times a day he would pray as Daniel did. In the word of God, we are admonished to praise the Lord at all times. And to be thankful and grateful for what he's done, is still doing, and will do. Have you ever thanked God in advance for what he's going to do? Yes, scripture tells us rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Rejoice always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. For his steadfast love endures forever. Oh, I think it was Richard Smallwood that said, I will sing praises. Praise unto you. I will sing praises. Praises unto you, I will sing praises. Praises unto you, I will sing praises. Praises unto you, I just want to praise you forever and ever and ever for all you've done for me. Blessings and glory. Give us strength in the time.
determination. Yes, our lives are in the palm of God's hands. His hands are more than capable and much better than all stands. We will be with him throughout the ceaseless age of eternity. So let's praise the Lord because we have so much to thank God for. I want to close with this poem that I wrote last night. Women after God's own heart is what we aim to be. Living our lives for the master in complete harmony. Praying without ceasing and studying God's word. To fail in this endeavor would be completely absurd. For we know that we need him every step of the way to lead and guide us each and every day. We will not allow anyone or anything to stand in his place, for he's our all in all, and we can't wait to see his face. Sometimes we'll slip and fall, and we'll make mistakes too, but his mercy and his grace covers me and you. We have to be mindful to repent and turn away, because then and only then will we not go astray. His Holy Spirit abides in us, helping us to do right, speaks to our heart, makes our burdens light. Yes, we're women after God's own heart. No hidden agendas for you and I. My mind on another time, on another time, and here I need to stand until God gives me more light, and that. Oh, oh, oh. 
our Father is so thankful. Before we even saw our vow, we planned for this moment in time. We sent Jesus to die for us while we were dead sinners. And you sent your Holy Spirit to abide in us as we open our hearts to you. So here, right here, right now, Father, in the name of Jesus, touch each one of our hearts and let us hear you knocking. Let us answer the door to our Let you come in. In a new way, in a refreshing way, in, a, in, in, in every way. We surrender to you. We thank you for your persistence and your patience. Thank you for loving us. Love begins to love, Father. So we give back to you. Let's be the one you are all in all. Thank you, Father. Forgive us. And I'm just thankful. I'm very thankful. And it's good to see so many people coming back out. It's so good to be getting hats in this COVID situation. But my God, who loves us, who died for us, who is still chasing us until we run into him, he's going to catch us if we allow us. Stand and look through the door. We want to thank God for all that He did. I'm Father now for God, and we're so thankful for the worship you've been with us. May our worship have been acceptable to you. Thank you for the blessing. Now, in the each of us as we depart this place, keep us safe and bring us back together in the morning time. May we serve you 